This season, turn it up to 10. Sort of like a bad habit, we gon' do it again. Ready or not, we're gonna tie up some ends. Go tell a 36, try to grab all the friends. We're back like we never left. On track like a treble clef. Skip a beat on the seventh rest. Bring feast, we don't pass them over. We got the first fruits, no way to show us. Can't live on that bread alone. Every word of God's mouth will fuel me on. That's scripture, that's Christ alone. That's grace alone, that's faith alone. All glory to God, cause that's his alone. Since the land's been slain, we can each belong. The Lord is my strength, my peace, and my song. Get our it all down at the feet of his throne. This yoke is easy, this burns light. Even with a loud mouth trying to eat at the mic. Even if we down south, the humidity spike. Fails torn in two, so we gon' be all right. It's all grace till the half goes off. Heretics better run till the top blows off. Got them all stood still like a job full of Botox. Time to bring them down like a jaw on a blow pop. Don't stop, they're in need of it though. Through grace, by faith, they could easily grow. New wave, new age, new way to see bro. Now one truth, life, one way to his throne. It's the year of the feast, we gon' grow some Time to put some meat on the bones Gotta put the milk down, son, it's time to leave home I'm just saying there's a time and a season You gotta be a Berean If you just hear and believe it You could be walking with demons It could be rendering Caesar All the things that go to God That's a little like treason Wait, welcome back, my friends Did you ever really think we could pass the 10? Our stock's up, we about to trend Cause the whole 36 wanna rap again Wait, sounds too good to be true Like we're in candy land Ain't no ladders, just shoot We hold true if it's loaded in the cannon Best believe it's understanding If it's not, it ain't proof like sacred name of the two house frame ears start to tickle then you fill it in the blanks you better not you be better off not trying to hassle hop you can take it to the bank this night ready he's about to go walk put the ring on your finger from the cracker jack box it's hide and seek let's see if you can find out all the little messages he hit before the time out ever seen a scholar with a blue belt i have he's about to make your food melt the loud one and he strikes again but don't let him close range he gonna bite your friends so relax gotta still in control he knows every care every bit that you hold he knows every hair every need for your soul nothing the new round here, this story's been told I bet you feel weak and your life is in tatters With bruised feet, your body is battered You can't reach, trying to climb up that ladder Sit back and hold fast to Messiah Matters These guys are happy. It is Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. This is Messiah Matters number 469. Let's get ready for Passover! My name is Caleb Hag. <laughs> I'm with you. Looking forward to Passover and Unleavened Bread and Canon the Omer and Shavuot slash Pentecost. I'm Rob Danoff. It's going to be lit, as the kids say today. As the kids are saying... 100%. I am excited. Man, you know, it says that we got people in the chat room, but nobody's saying anything. Hello, chat room. I hope you're all doing well out there in internet land, in the webs. In the chat room. In the chat room. Let's get, let's get, <clears throat> excuse me. I got something in my lungs today. I don't know what's going on. You're going to hear me hit this uh, cough button multiple times, I'm sure. Um, okay, let's get some things. Well, actually, I still got my producers uh, coming up. Thank you, all, by the way, to all of our producers. Uh, we do have new producer art up. I don't know if it's on the website. I think it is. Um, I will check right now. Uh, give me just a second. Uh, while I do that, 
uh, chegg at torresource.com. It's C-H-E-G-G at torresource.com. That is the uh, email address. Also, 253-465-3205. It is 253-465-3205. And, of course, this show, if you want to listen to past shows, you can go to messiahmatters.com. By the way, that's where you can buy producer producer credits. I'm pretty sure, uh, Mike, if you want to check that real quick for me, that'd be very helpful if, on Messiah Matters. Go look and see if there is uh, the producer credit uh, mug is showing there. If not, it will be by the end of the day. So by the time, if you're not watching this live, by the time you do watch this, um, you will uh, be able to get your new your spring producer credit. Sorry, it took me so long, um, but uh, we're. We're moving along. We're getting some. So I say every every week that uh, we got some great things going on. I'm going to tell you this. We have a new platform for the uh, library that we're creating right now, and um, it's going to allow people to have monthly memberships, which is going to be really nice. Um, and it's going to include some um, some courses as well. And so very excited for that. That should be up probably within the next two weeks. My hope. And I might be pushing it a little bit on that, but I'm going to, I'm going to try my hardest for the next two weeks. So that's one of the reasons that uh, everything's taking me longer is because we're just mad dashing it to try to get all this done. And uh, of course this will be on the platform torresource.com, which is our producer. You can go find all sorts of stuff on torresource.com and uh, our new library uh, membership is going to be up shortly. And some of our courses in an evergreen format is going to be up shortly. We're going to have a new book called Is the Torah Only for Jews? That's going to be up in the next month or two. Uh, we're just very excited. We got so much like on the horizon. It's uh, it's going to be great. Uh, and if you're watching the chat, then Mike has just put uh, the link to the producer credit. Thank you, Mike, for that. Appreciate it. Uh, go get an executive producer credit now, if you please. That Last, is but, one cool logo. I just am looking at it for the first time. Yep. The VW. You know, I, I was a Volkswagen guy. It's all I would drive up until I uh, until I got married. And then I was That's asked, clever. I was asked to, to get rid of my Volkswagen Eurovan, and a single tear still falls from my eye. All right. Uh, finally, last but certainly not least, please. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. If you're already subscribed, go ahead. Give us a thumbs up. It really does help us. I know it sounds weird, but it does help us. Okay. We want to... Uh, evergreen. Uh, Brenda says, evergreen dot dot dot. Uh. Um, if you don't know what an evergreen course format is, it means that you sign up for it. There's no teacher involved. I mean, obviously, the teacher teaches the course and whatnot, but all of the information is already up there. You can go watch the lectures. You can listen to whatever you can do assignments. You can download all the material, everything that you can go through it at your own pace and you have it in perpetuity. You can always go back to it. You can always look at it. Um, and so, yeah, that's what evergreen means. You're not uh, interacting with a teacher per se, but you have all of the information that you could ever want. And, uh, your, uh, all of your quizzes can be done multiple times. So yeah, you can, uh, it's, it's going to be good. All right, let's jump in. We do have a lot to talk about today. Something that I didn't think, so I was scrambling yesterday trying to find stuff to talk about. And one thing led to another. <clears throat> now, um, Mr. C wrote in, he's in the chat room, by the way. Hello, Mr. C. And um, basically, uh, he's talking about ZT. So, sorry, I'm trying to keep an eye on the... Uh, on the uh, chat room as well. The Hebrew course with your dad, is it that way? Uh, the Hebrew course with my dad is not that way yet, but it will be in the library that way at some point, in the new library at some point that way. So um, anyway, not the point. Okay, let's go back to Cliff, to Mr. C. Mr. C writes in, he's talking about ZZ. He says, I understand the issue of differing, differing clothing over the ages. Now, by the way, for those who don't know, first of all, ZZ are the tassels that men like myself and Rob wear on our uh, on the corners of our, well, today it's on the corner of a shirt usually. Um, some people in the Hebrew roots in the Messianic movement will wear them on belt loops. Um, there's disputes over whether or not that's halakhically acceptable or not, yada, yada. <clears throat> but ultimately, the big uh, argument against wearing ZT today by some in the Torah movement is that uh, it was for a time and a place. 
So it was for a specific, specific kind of garment. It was in a specific culture that has gone away now. And since those garments have gone away, we are no longer, and since that uh, tradition with outside of um, Israel, outside of uh, ancient Near Eastern culture, rather, has gone away, uh, the commandment has essentially gone away as well. Um, okay, so um, it's an interesting argument. I don't hold to that. I believe that we should be wearing ZZ. Now, it should also, some of this needs to be, uh, some history needs to be brought up. Zitzi were not just for Israel. People in the ancient Near East wore tassels on their garments. Um, and we see this, uh, there's a lot of evidence to this. In fact, there's a lot of paintings and whatnot that you'll see where people were wearing tassels on their garments. And uh, they, they were to represent flowers. And um, so this, and you can see this actually in Zitzi. Uh, if they're cut too short, they'll actually flare out like a flower. Okay. And it is believed that only uh, high up officials, royalty, and sometimes military commanders were the ones who wore tassels on their garments. It was like, uh, it was like a status symbol that you had garments that had tassels on them, like these kind of uh, decorative tassels on them. And I think it's this is actually like, uh, in our culture, the king of rock and roll, Elvis had tassels. That's called fringe, my friend. Fringe is different than tassels. Come on, get it right. No, he had um, tassels and fringe. Fringes okay. and tassels. Okay. Now, he okay. had them on his sleeves, too. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> so we're taking Elvis now as the model. No, anyway, so the, the point here, I think that this actually does play into uh, why God gave Israel as a nation. Tzitzit. Because I think it shows that each person in his elected uh, people group uh, whether you're adopted in or whether you're part of the lineage of Jacob, whatever it may be, that you are a a nation of priests, right? That we are, that there's something different. There is something, each one of us are special and set apart unto God. And for this reason alone, I think that Zitzit are, uh, to me, they are very, they mean a lot. In fact, in the in the specific command that when we look at them, we're supposed to remember the commandments of the Lord. I don't think it's just that we're supposed to call to mind the commandments. It's that we're covenant members. It's that we have been set apart. We have a, each individual person has a special covenantal relationship with God that is, we are seen as royalty. We're, we're sons of the most high God, right? And so I think that, that all of this is going to play into Mr. C's Next question. He says, I have a couple of sets that I have uh, ordered and have started wearing them. I have waffled between wearing two versus four as they get in the way at, at times as when removing and putting items in my pocket. Let's stop right there. Now, Rob, I want you to jump in real quick. Tell me, yes, tell me if I, if you think I'm off in what I've said so far and also respond to what you've heard so far. Oh, I think, um, I, I think it is uh, it does seem to have some connection to clothing, right? I mean, it, in the same way other nations sacrificed, you know, there, there there's, they had special holidays, you know, cal calendrical celebration. So right. if, if that's true, and it's true that there is iconography, I'd probably, I don't know, maybe paintings would be in Egypt and there might be some, but I know that there's um, like, in Assyrian reliefs and stuff like that, you can see, uh, which probably were painted originally. Um, but in by, the way, event, by the way, by the way, hang on just a second. If, if you would like to see some of those, I did an entire video on this on pronomian.com on uh, Zitzit and I, uh, or is it a written article? It might be a written article. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it, it's not. It's, it's definitely a video. Anyway, in that video, I show some of the, uh, some of the evidence that we have, the, the paintings and whatnot and the, and the reliefs. Keep going. Um, but, but yeah, it's, a, I mean, it's a warning about our eyes and our heart, right? That our eyes go after things of the world and that the tzitzit are a reminder for us. It interrupts that tendency of, of the sinful heart, um, and to remember, you know, to whom we belong and the covenant of like Caleb was saying, you know, the, co our covenant membership looks like something right it's not an undefined relation a relationship with god and our place in his kingdom is not an undefined 
place. It's not a space where we have to, in, it's left on us to invent religion. It's not uh, to invent our worship of God. I mean, right. we see what happened with Native and Avihu when they had an idea to invent religion, right? It's like, no, we, we, we're, we're, it's a blessing to abide within the, the things that God has revealed to us as for our good. It doesn't mean we understand them all. And for me, the tzitzits are a little bit of a mystery, and I'm okay with that, I, uh, right. because it is a curious thing. Well, let's um, keep... Let's and, keep, let's and, keep... To the, and to the point, I remember once, way back, that we're probably talking 25 years ago, I I don't do it anymore, but I had tzitzit that I looped on belt buckles, because that's, that's what the people I learned from were doing. And I remember, like... I mean, home, and one of them was gone. I only had I only had three, and I was like, "Oh no!" It was like, "What happened?" So I think it got stuck on something because I had, I had times, and even now with you know wearing the in a different way, it can get if you're not careful, like in a yeah, they uh, rip out right in your seatbelt. You know, it can get stuck. Like there's places, and and so I, I understand what um, uh, what Mister C is talking about with like. You know, and you definitely, here, here's the thing. If you're doing like, like, you know, not that I'm like a big do it yourself, fix it or fix her up or guy, but like if you're doing stuff where you're dealing with tools and stuff, I don't, I don't have my TT. I, I don't, right. you know, if I'm doing work, I, I don't want them to get stuck or cut or. I or So, anything. okay, let's pause for a second. I have, I have on that note, I actually do have a set of TT that are specifically for work. Oh yeah. How does that, oh, Cool. Oh, they're all shredded. They look, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I wear them anytime. I, so anyway, um, but That's yeah, and good, I also I like that. I, like I also that. make mine so that uh, I, I make them off of my shirt and then I'm able to loop them into my shirt. You know, I have a four cornered shirt mm -hmm. and so I can loop them so I can take them off and put different ones on. That way I can wash the shirt itself without having to wash nice, it. Nice. Anyway, so let's get back to Mr. C's. Uh, and I do want to, we need to hurry a little bit on this because we have, uh, we already have P, uh, questions coming in about Passover and uh, that's great. Let's keep going with Mr. C's uh, uh, question. He says, I have waffled between wearing two versus four. There's nothing in the scripture specifically that says you have to have four. Um, there's nothing that says that two is uh, a must. <clears throat> it just simply says on the corners of your garments. Now, what however you take well, that Deuteronomy says four on the four corners on the four so. corners of your garment right all right but but I, I mean the question is is it on the corners or is it so once again going back to the garment itself are we talking about a specific garment that they're wearing how does that how does that translate into a circular bottom like a shirt that we have today are we talking about belt loops but I I digress and I and I relent to to uh, Rob's superior biblical knowledge that that there should be four, right? Okay, so you think that there should be four? Is that is that your is that well, your halakhic that's decision? I, that's I think the simple meaning of is it like Deuteronomy fourteen or I, I'm not sure. Rob has spoken, me. so so there you go from from his You'll lips to it. your ears. Um, okay, so four is the number. I have a couple of different lengths. Okay, I don't think length has anything to do with it except for what Yeshua says, right? The Pharisees make theirs long in order that people can see them. And um, 22, I've, 12. That's the <clears throat> Deuteronomy there you 22, go. 12. All right. <clears throat> um, let's keep going with his comment, though, because he's got even more, to, uh, even more to, to ask. I only wear them when in public, is that is about the only time I wear regular pants. At home, I wear swe uh, sweats or bib overalls. My understanding of ZZ goes back to before I was led to TR, and as such, I may have picked up bad info, such as ZZ are an external identifier as a people, as a people in the ancient uh, times. My wife has questioned not wearing them at home and only in public. Um, once again, I like personally, I would say this. I think that there's no there's nowhere in scripture that says you have to wear them all the time. You have to wear them when you're sleeping. You have to wear them at home. You have to there, there's th this comes down to personal halakhic family halakhic decisions. <clears throat> and for me, I would simply say this. I think that it is an honor and a I think it shows that uh that I am that I've been set apart. I think it's another way that God shows that we are set apart. Right. <clears throat> that he puts a stamp on us. And so if you only wear, want to wear them uh, when you go out, that's totally fine. Uh, I don't think that the scriptures say anything against that. However, 
I personally would say I find it as a bad, I wear them as a badge of honor. That's, that's my personal opinion. And, uh, he, he goes on to say that his wife, she can, she's concerned that it's, it's like the Pharisees who only wear them to, uh, so that people will notice them. I, I don't think that that's Mr. C's, uh, intention. And there's an intention of the heart here, right? The Pharisees wear them so that people will say, wow, look at how holy you are. I don't think that that is the case here. She also reminds, reminded me that there should be, uh, for each as Rob has now, crushed my first comment. Okay. Um, so my wife takes it as he is addressing individuals and as such, the tzitzit are personal and to remind us individually and along with that, that they are not to be seen by others. Uh, so I, I think that they are to be seen by others. I think that it, it shows, you know, the fact that the, I think that the, the fact that they, that, however, I think that it is both. I think it's both that we wear them as uh, a gift from the almighty right? He's, he's concerned about our clothing. He's concerned about our food. He's concerned about every aspect of our life he, ha, he is a part of. And so I think that, that it, it plays into that. Uh, I also think that it's a sign to other people that I am a servant of the Most High. But I think this comes down to personal halakha, Mr. C, and I think that this is, unfortunately, this is the answer you're probably not going to like. I personally think that this is something that you're going to have to work out on your own. And something that you're going to have to decide for yourself and for your household. I I know Mr. C, so I know that Mr. C, it's just him and his wife at, in their home. But ultimately, this is a, a household halakha that you are going to have to decide on yourself. I personally wear them uh, pretty much all the time. Every once in a while. Yesterday, I didn't wear them when I was uh, pressure washing my sidewalk. Um, even though I do have a work pair, it was just too hot. And uh, yeah, so, you know. My kids, my son doesn't wear a seat except for when he goes uh, to church or goes to a congregation. Um, and as he gets older, uh, we will talk about that and how he, you know, how he wants to live that out. All right. I hope that answers some questions for you. It probably doesn't. But uh, yeah, anything else you want to say about that before we move to Passover stuff there, Rob? I, I just say, I, you know, I concur with Caleb with what you're saying that this is a there's multiple facets and every point brought up was was true we're not to do things in order to be seen so that's that's a heart check right. however it is true that the commandment and the commandment is personally for us but it's also for others to see also so there's we have to take each of these constraints that are given in the scripture and seek to walk in it to see to seek to walk in that and it's okay if you like you know you find it like caleb was saying you got to find your walk with between you and the lord and um you know there there's times when you know when wearing seat seat you're like it's you're ob you're obvious or it feels like you're obvious because you're somewhere out in public and you're obviously the only person within miles, probably wearing seat seat. Uh, on the other hand, I remember one time my wife and I were at, were at Costco, I think, or something. And a, a local person we know uh, was walking around and literally they had seat seat down to their knees and they were all white. Okay. And so, and I was like, okay. Um, to me now, again, my, my interpretation is that that's this way too long. Like that's, that's re I thought, According My to our first thought is this is to, ridiculous. According to you know, our and, rabbi, right? According to our rabbi. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the rabbi were, tells us like, not to like do that. The guys walking around and these are like octopus legs, like flying around. And here's the other <laughs> thing is that they're white, which means they didn't have the tehillah. Right. Okay. So to me, I felt uncomfortable. Now I had seats on, but mine are like, you know, pretty short and they're, they're not, you know, so that See, was weird to me. So I'm, but I'm telling you, this is my, I'm, it's a, it's a personal, my personal sense was that's, that's. So I whacked. have, I have two, I, sometimes I feel bad because my ZT are, are, are short, right? And they're short. And sometimes my, my shirt will actually almost cover them up completely. And I don't feel comfortable with that, but I, I don't want them too long either. And the only other pair that I have is a pair for dress pants. 
And the reason I have them for dress pants is because I have them really long, like this long before the seat seat starts, before the, the ties start. And I do that so that I can push them all the way down on my pants so that I can pull, I can push my button up shirt all the way down. And oh, so you can tuck your dress shirt in. So I can tuck my dress shirt yeah. and then they loop up and back over. And then they're only about this long when they come out. Gotcha. Anyway. All right. All right. So see, this is all. Enough, enough of the personal clothing. Okay. But you can Let's... see, you can see why in different Jewish factions, they have like real strict, these things are all right. defined and, yep. and you would know which group you belong to just by that. For example, the Tehillit would be one, one factor. Another is how are they tied? Right. right. These are things that it's not like all the Jewish world is unified on this. My dad said to me the other day, he, he looked at my tzitzit and he goes, man, I have never seen tzitzit tied like that. <laughs> it's like, yes, <laughs> somebody noticed because I, I decided I wasn't going to take any of the rabbinical tyings. So I just, Two knots, and then I wrap 50 times. And I do that so that it looks almost like a stem of a flower, but mm -hmm. it also is the Jubilee, right? 50 for the Jubilee year, right? And uh, and I didn't want to look like anyone else. So, um, Caleb, you already don't look like any. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Gotcha. All right, let's move on. This is going to be a good one. Oh, man, I'm so excited. I, I love it when we talk about Passover. And today we have some Passover talk. First of all, I got into a lengthy conversation with someone on the, uh, the YouTubes on, in the comments section uh, about when Yeshua was, was crucified. Okay, now, the, somebody asked me this the other day. Somebody asked me, why does the chronology matter? Why does the chronology matter? It seems like such a trivial thing, right? And you got groups like 119 Ministries and others who have put out these charts saying that Yeshua died on a Wednesday. Now, I think that there's definitive proof that he clearly did not die on a Wednesday because John yeah, says bad. it was Friday. That's just, that's, John that's, says it was Friday. Not to, and we'll get to that in just a second because that's I mean that's how I ended the, the conversation with this person. I said, well, John said he was was uh, was crucified on a Friday, and he said, show me the verses. So I posted three verses, and we'll get to those in just a second. Why does the chronology matter? Well, I'll tell you why the chronology matters for me. When Yeshua says in, in Luke twenty two nineteen, do this in remembrance of me. I believe that this is a clear de declaration of deity, as I have said on this program many times. Okay, this, the, the Passover meal, the Pascha meal, as he says, four verses prior to that, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you, the, uh, is, it, it, that has to include the Passover lamb, which is a sacrifice. So when Yeshua says, do this as a memorial to me, First of all, to do the Passover is uh, seen in Exodus 20. We are to do the Passover, right? And it is supposed to be a memorial to yod heh vav -Heh throughout your generations, right? So he's using Tanakh language. Do this in, as a memorial, but not to yod heh vav -Heh, but to me. So once again, this is a high Christology. He is saying that he is yod heh vav -Heh. Beyond that, there's a sacrifice involved. So there are plenty of scholars who say, well, Yeshua never said that, that we should sacrifice to him. Yes, he, yes, he did. Luke twenty two nineteen. do this in remembrance of me. You are to do a sacrifice unto Yeshua. This is a, this is a vitally important passage, in my opinion, showing that Yeshua is, in fact, claiming to be yod heh vav -Heh. Now, what happens if Yeshua is, uh, is not, if, if Yeshua's last supper is not a Passover meal? Then that all fi falls away. None of that makes sense. His language doesn't equate to the to the Exodus. There's no Passover lamb on the on the table. Well, why would? Yeah, I mean, the whole point of I've desired to eat this, eat Passover, this Passover with over. you. Where send them to the city, and the guy will meet you, and you say, "Where am I to eat Passover with my disciples?" Like how? So pe people will say that that this is all the day before Passover. This is Nisan 13, and this is what is known as the Johannine chronology. And this is the other point, is that the if you have the Johannine chronology says that the synoptic gospels are off, they're wrong. That is an inerrancy problem. Now you're talking about scripture having a mistake. 
The other way, the synoptic uh, chronology will say, well, John is doing this for theological purposes. Like a it's midrash, not, yeah. Yeah, it's not really, it's not real. And so once again, now you're talking about not just using a midrash, but uh, like uh, giving false facts. Once again, I think that this is, this is a theological problem, okay? So I think it's vitally important that both John and the synoptic gospels line up. Now, <clears throat> let's go to my claim that John says that it was, in fact, Friday. And it, Matthew does too, by the way. The next day, that is after the day of preparation. The chief pre This is Matthew uh, 27, 62. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. Okay, so uh, this, this is on Shabbat. This is on Saturday. Now, he uses the word preparation here. And people are going to say, well, people who hold to various, especially people who hold to a Wednesday crucifixion, right? Oh, well, Yeshua was, was crucified on, on, you know, he had his last supper on Wednesday, crucified on Thursday. Um, this, by the way, doesn't work. Anyway, John 19, 14. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. And see, people say, aha, see, it was, it was the, they were preparing for Passover. That's not what this means. That is not what this means. And I can prove this, I think. First of all, the day preparation, this is how they said Friday. This is how they said Friday. Um, and we have evidence of this, first of all, throughout the, the apostolic scriptures, the New Testament, they use preparation as the day Friday, okay? However, the Didache 8.1 says, but do not let your feast, by the, this is all to show non-canonical support for the fact that the, day, that the word preparation means Friday. But do not let your fa uh, fast coincide with those of the hypocrites. They, they fast on Monday and Thursday. So you must fast on Wednesday and preparation, Friday. <clears throat> the martyrdom of Polycarp 7.1 says, taking the slave, then police and Calvary went out on preparation. The footnote says this, this Greek word preparation is for, uh, is the preparation for the Sabbath and has always been used in the Greek church for Friday. <clears throat> and what do you think the word for Friday is today in Greek? Look up the word Friday in Greek. The word has not changed. It's the word preparation. That's what it's called. Friday is called preparation. When he says in, in John 19, 14, now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. In the Greek, it says, now we could translate it this way. Now it was Friday of Passover. Right. And this is what he means. He does not mean it was preparing the day before Passover. That is, it was Nisan 14. There is not one. I can't, I've looked. You cannot find. And if you can find it, please let me know. Show me any instance in first century literature anywhere where Nisan 14 is referred to as preparation. You will not find it. And this is why in the Synoptic Gospels, it says it was the day the lambs were slaughtered. He doesn't say it was the preparation for the, for the Passover. That is Nisan 14. He says, now it was the day that the lambs were slaughtered. This is how they referred to Nisan 14. So once again, within the biblical text, the writers tell us it was Friday. I'm sorry. I know this screws with your whole three days and three nights thing. By the way, I think that that is a complete misunderstanding of the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah was not that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. The Ninevites didn't see Jonah and they go, he was gone for three days and three nights. Aha, he must be, he must be a prophet. No, they thought he was dead. And then he came back. Okay. I did a whole series on, or I did a whole video on this on how any part of a day can constitute a day. And the synoptic gospels say he rose on the third day, not after the third day. Would you like to say anything about this before we move on? Um, no, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Oh, come on, Rob. Um, All right. All right, fine. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it. it well, the uh, other thought I had was we watched a video. It might have been on Mystery Bible Theater. The guy talking about why Sunday is the new Sabbath. Right. Like this, this fact that in the early church, Prescue only meant for always meant like the sixth day of the week. Like it was just a cultural, and this is Jewish Greek culture. This isn't Christian culture. This is right diaspora Jewish culture. Right. And then that was because the first Christians were all Jews, many of whom spoke Greek, of course, that they, that was just the term 
preparation. So they continued to think in terms of preparation. And, and here's the other thing is why would you back to, this is again, I'm pivoting back to that discussion about why Sunday, the people arguing Sunday is the new Sabbath, the gospels were written. Like if Yeshua had changed the Sabbath with his death and resurrection, that means every epistle written and every gospel that mentions the Sabbath, we're talking up to what, 40 years later, possibly in some cases written that still presume people, the readers understand, Oh, he's talking about six day of the week. Oh yeah. He's right. talking about Shabbat. It's so again, I'm, I know I'm like pivoting back to that conversation, but it's still in my mind how, how that particular, I think it was Doug Wilson or someone teaching that, you know, right. the new Sabbath with the resurrection is, is now Sunday. And this fact, this simple fact of this Greek term, I think it's in uh, it's Spanish. The day Sabbath day is Sabado. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's another example where it is. It doesn't mean that Spanish people keep Sabbath. It just is a cultural Right. It's just a cultural relic. Right. It's just it, we're not going to change. Now they call this Sunday, I think, don't, uh, Domingo or something like I'm going to be completely world. honest. I said yes, but I have no clue. My wife's going anyway, to speak Spanish, not me. But I'm, I'm totally rambling on a weird footnote. No, no, no. You're good. Actually, I think that it is helpful. The, the point is, is that why would you use the word that they use for Friday in in those texts? Okay, let's move on. So Rob Van Hoff emailed me this morning and said this. <clears throat> his sister's oh, asking. Question. Yeah, his sister, my sister called this morning asking if we could talk about the cups of Luke 22 and your inter interpretation of the meal as a date non. We certainly can. This never gets old for me. I'm sure the people in the chat it's room like are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> here we go again. Right. Um, he wrote back and said specifically, she asked whether they drank at Luke twenty two seventeen. Says it only says divide it among yourselves. And is it possible that they each took Yeshua's cup and passed it around, each filling their own smaller cup with wine from his cup? But then they wait and do not drink it until after the bread at verse twenty. In other words, is this cup poured out at verse twenty? The same one divided among them back in seventeen. Okay. It was a great question. I hope <laughs> I captured her question. That that was in my paraphrasing, but that's what sure. I understood her question to be. Let's read the text so, real quick. Dear sister, I apologize if I misheard. Go ahead. Luke 20, let's start at 14. So 22, 14. And when the, the hour came, he reclined at table. By the way, I wrote an article and I've already posted it in the chat room. Um, <clears throat> and um, it is meal traditions and the Passover meal. Um, it's on pronomian.com. It's the latest blog post. Um, the, a lot of the questions about tradition in the, uh, in the Passover Seder and the, uh, the cultural banquets that they had is answered in that. So um, if you have any more questions, please go check that out. Um, so Luke twenty two fourteen 14 says, and uh, the reason I brought that up is because it says that they reclined at table. A lot of people are going to see this as reclining at the Passover table. Like we, like tradition does today, right? Recline. Why? Because we were once, we were once uh, slaves and now we're free. This is not why they reclined the table at all. The, this is uh, a well known. I mean, the archaeological evidence alone for this is overwhelming. They found they find them not only in uh, Roman uh, Roman houses and, and banquet halls, but also in Jewish synagogues because the Jews had adopted the, the triclinia and um, people reclined. They they Wait had couches. Caleb, I got to stop you right there. Don't you know that that's oral Torah? I can, I, yeah, I can hear, I can hear they the did uh, that because they followed rabbinic halakha. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Yes, of course. No, uh, it, it, actually, this is one of the biggest pushbacks that I get from um, Messianics is a lot of Messianics want the later rabbinic tradition to be uh, read back into the first century. And so the notion that this was all cultural and not rabbinic tradition is outside of the realm of possibility for a lot of people. And they will die on that hill, even though the evidence is, I mean, uh, overwhelming, like it, it, it's 100%. There's no, there's no question. So, and when the hour had, claimed, had, 
When the hour came, rather, he reclined at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Pascha with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Um, or I won't eat it again till it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. I believe that this is actually your sister's question, and I will come. I will roll back to it. 18 is, I think, where her question comes in. 19. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Behold, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me at the table. There's, people will see this as dipping, right? He dips. Um, and I, I cover this in the article that I wrote and have already referenced on pronomia.com. Um, this was a uh, well-known Near Eastern, and still is today, Near Eastern tradition that uh, there are community bowls and people dip and uh, scoop out onto their own uh, onto their own either bread. A lot of it was scooped out onto bread instead of plates. Um, so I do not see this as dipping uh, like the later, much later. We don't see dipping uh, herbs until the Talmudic time. And I think that this actually comes from the idea of um, that the lamb was supposed to be roasted in, in bitter herbs. And so they're trying to retain this commandment in a different way. Um, and which is, and so once the, the temple is destroyed, we see this, uh, come into effect in the Talmudic era. Okay. <clears throat> Back to 18. I think what your sister is asking, and I could be wrong, is that he has a cup before the, it seems like in 17, he has this cup before the, the, um, before the Passover meal. And then in 18, he says, I'm not going to drink it again. But then there's another cup that's given after the meal. So what gives? Um, and the scholars have debated this at length as well. Did he partake of the cup after the meal or not? And how could he do that if he took, uh, partook of the cup before the meal and said, I'm never going to drink again? My contention is, yes, there are two cups. There's one before the meal. There's one after the meal. Okay. And this is traditional at the, uh, at the Roman banquet, right? You have one beforehand, you have one after afterwards. You did not take, according to, uh, Dennis Smith, you would not take the cup and pour it into your own, but the cup that is offered to the deity before the meal is then shared by all because it is a partaking of the offering to said God. Now, I think that this obviously is done for Yod Vave, right? Where they're doing it in memorial to God. It is the Passover, right? But this is not this is not specific to the Passover meal in the first century. This is any banquet and throughout religions, right? Okay. So I also think that his uh, his that our Lord's declaration that I will not drink again. I don't think that this has to do with a specific cup or that he's saying I won't drink wine again. In fact, uh, in John, he drinks wine, sour wine on the cross, right? I think that what he's saying is that he will not participate in the, uh, in, the Paso in the ritual of Passover again until he does it in the kingdom. And the reason why is because, as I've said, I think that the, uh, the, the wine is a bookend. So you have one at the beginning of the meal proper, you have one at the end of the meal proper, and this shows the ceremonial aspects of that meal itself. And so I have no problem with him saying, I'm going to participate in this meal with you, but after this meal is over, I'm not going to do it again until I do it in the, in the kingdom. So that cup does not represent just that specific cup. It represents all cups within the meal. And it doesn't represent wine. It represents the ceremonial aspects of the Passover itself. That's, my, that's what I believe. And so I have no problem with him, even if he takes the, the cup after the meal and partakes of it, it's still the same quote unquote cup. It's still the same ceremonial aspect of the entire meal. That is how I've seen it. And that's what I believe. We see it in first Corinthians too, right? Um, he says in first Corinthians, I'm sorry, where is it? Uh, first Corinthians 11. Uh, yeah, it's 11. I'm just looking for it here because I did have it open, but now I don't have it open. Anyway, I'll find it. Rob, take it away, man. What do you have to say? There's so much here. Um, <laughs> there is a lot. Yeshua here. is citing. I, I, I like what you're saying, and I'm, I'm. This is always, you know, every year. This is what's so awesome about the liturgy that God has given us with the feasts. 
because in my opinion, the, these discussions are inexhaustible by design because a there's stuff I forget every year. So that in and of itself, like, you know what I mean? So the, that in and of itself is one of the functions of the rehearsal, right? Of doing it again, of remembrance. Because remember, remembrance is a core thing, like you pointed out. And, but then there's also stuff I've never seen before. Right. And then there's stuff that I go, oh, I, I forgot about that. You know, so, so it, it's inexhaustible. And this is an opportunity for us. So I, I really uh, enjoy these kinds of conversations and I, I enjoy the perspective you bring. And I've, I've two kind of two, two questions. The first one, let me, hopefully I'll get it out, but then I'll say my second, my first question for you, Caleb is, would you, would you argue that the, the expression of the command of the Passover or the Pesach using a form that is the Daipnon is an example of how we, just like we were talking about the tzitzit, like we need to, it's on the believer to find a way to express in a new time and place to fulfill the commandment. Okay, so, but don't answer that yet. So I just wanted to get that out. So in terms of, is there a, is there something we could learn that isn't even Passover specific, but is commandment specific with respect to our specific cultures? We could talk about food, stuff like that. The other one is, has to do just back to Yeshua saying, I'm not going to drink this again. I, one aspect that sticks out to me is that he can't, he can't shed his blood twice. And that the two scriptures, particularly, I think in Luke, he he cites Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, and he cites Isaiah 53, which is he will be numbered with the transgressors. And he is talking about do this in remembrance of me. So his shed blood, we, so Yeshua himself sets us up to go, wow, we are coming to this annual Passover meal, which Yeshua has celebrated every year of his life. Like we learned right. that earlier in you, Luke, Luke says when he was 12 years old, this, they did this every year. So Yeshua had eaten many Passovers, but from the foundation of the world, this is a Passover that he says, it, I have, I have longed with longing to, to eat this with you. Okay. That to me, is he speaking from before the foundation of the world? Like, and then, and then he ties in the, the concept of God writing his Torah on the hearts of his people and the, the lonely being numbered, you know, the lonely Messiah being num numbered with the transgressors, right? Isaiah 53, and that he, that he is a sacrifice, right? That he is giving himself and intercedes and right in that same context, he does not intercede for Judas, but he intercedes for Peter because Satan's Satan is at the door throughout. Satan enters Judah, right. Judas and Luke or, and Yeshua doesn't do anything about it. it. says, go do it. But Peter, he says, Satan has desired to sift. And there it's curious because he says to sift you all. It's in the plural. Right. But then he goes to to Peter and he says, <clears throat> "I've prayed for you specifically. When you're restored, etc., build, you know, strengthen your brothers." And uh, and then of course you have that moment where Peter denies Yeshua for the final time, and he looks and it says, "The Lord see." He catches eyes with Yeshua, and then he run, he goes out and weeps. So I mean, it's, there's so much packed in here that, but but to this idea of of Yeshua saying, this is the one, like, I can't do this again in this world, right? Like there, there's something happening with Jeremiah 31, with Isaiah 53, with this specific, and with unique, Exodus 12, unrepeatable and with, event. And with Exodus 12. Exodus 12. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's I mean, I, I know that sounds weird, but it, I, because it doesn't seem like it's a prophetic text, but you're right. All of these texts, all these prophetic texts are pointing to this one place, right? In other words, and Ariel Berkowitz uh, did a great teaching that we that is titled uh, "The Exodus Gospel," and what what he argues in that uh, teaching, and I think he's absolutely right, is that the Exodus itself 
is a prophecy of each one of our salvation stories. So it's an, it's a prophecy of, so we see a, a, a nation's uh, exodus and a nation's redemption out of slavery as a prophecy of each person's individual uh, salvation story. And it all points to this Passover, right? And this is where the shift comes when he says, do this in remembrance of me. What he's saying is this Exodus that we've seen and we've celebrated so many times since it happened is all pointing to this accident, uh, Exodus, the second Exodus, the true Exodus. And so we, we celebrate both. We celebrate this Exodus in light of the fact that we too have come out personally from slavery. Um, it, 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 I hope I'm touching on what you you are getting at. Is the, am I? Well, here's another aspect. So I saw a <clears throat> meme on the internet the other day, and it showed like the lintel and the doorposts, and it had like blood painted on it. And then it said, "God didn't look at the worthiness of anybody in the house. He just looked at whether there was blood on the door." And then they applied that to, and this is our salvation. Like, and my my response, I actually responded. I said, "Well." In ex, if you, I mean, your image is from Exodus twelve. Males had to be circumcised. They, they had to, you know, no foreigner could eat it. You had to bring the lamb into your into your yeah, house. Yeah, so yeah. so now the reason I pushed back was not because I'm I'm insisting that there's works that contribute to our righteousness, nor that those things made Israel worthy, but they are part of the the deal. And if if the Jeremiah thirty one Brit Hadashah is part of our thinking by Yeshua's instruction. Torah on the heart is is circumcision of the heart, right? right. These are the same thing, and so that's another aspect. Is the is this okay? So back to the other point, though. So is this an example of how a commandment has has an element of it that will be culturally? Um, subjective depending on time and place in history. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and actually, so this ties in, let's, let's get to burning bushcrafts, uh, question first. Um, because he says, so would doing the cups as they were commonly offered to deities be considered worshiping God in a manner such as the pagans? And I would say no. And the reason why is because it seems to me, and I did, I well, tried he, to, wait, he says, don't share the cup of demons. Right. So what does that mean, though? I, mean, in other, I think what Burning Bushcraft is asking is, can we actually participate in like the four cups or drinking cups of Passover to Yeshua is since the pagans do it? And my response to that is the pagans do all sorts of stuff and rip off, uh, you know, God's commands all the time. Oh, oh, they, just, yeah, they just, celebrate a new moon, right? They, they celebrate. celebrate a new moon. They get married. Yeah, okay. Right, I, pagans get married. Does that mean we can't get married because the pagans do it? They, you know, their their wedding ceremonies are offered to deities. Does that mean that we can't? There's all sorts of crossover. That's not the point. The point in in Rob's reference of First Corinthians and not sharing the the uh, table of demons. I completely agree. The, I think that in this. Uh, Another one would be sacrifice, right? The pagans sacrifice all the time to, to false gods. Does that mean we can't sacrifice anymore? No. What it means is that that uh, there are certain things that we are not able to do. In other words, we're not able to... You know, that's that's curious. Can I just interject? Sure. Elijah and the prophet of Baal, Elijah, they each offered a burnt offering. And right. they did all these things that didn't happen, but the fire consumed both. So that's a curious point. Now... It wasn't the prophets of Baal were not slaughtering a pig. I don't think if they had slaughtered a pig, I don't think Elijah would even have been there. But, <laughs> but they were all. The funny thing is, they're all just part of the funny fun of that story is that they're all obeying him. They're, he's right. telling them what to do in there. But, but did their dancing and cutting themselves and calling out to Baal make it so that the God's fire wouldn't consume it? And that's it's. I don't have an answer. It just it came to mind. Well, Burning Bushcraft uh, follows up right now, and he says, I ask because of the everything is pagan mindset, almost to refute the everything is pagan. And and the point here is this. I think that we see through... I, I've tried to trace back when dedicating wine became a a thing for Passover, and you just can't. It goes back so far that you can't, 
It, like wine has always been a representation of something, right? It's a, we, it's always been a rep. Like people have always dedicated wine and or alcoholic beverage and food to God. That's what they've done. And the pagans have done it. And, and, uh, the, the worship of Yodhe Vavhe people have done it as well. We see that, uh, you know, we, we see the same thing, even, even Noah sacrifices to God, right? So food is all, and I would argue that the sacrifice always has to do with meal. A sacrifice always has to do with a meal, right? Whether or not we participate in it or not, that's not the point. The sacrifice always has to do with eating. And so, People are going to bring up like whole burnt offerings and whatnot. My point is, is that in that case, God is the one who is uh, is the representation of the of the one taking the meal. Okay, so but the point is simply this: that uh, it, it's not whether or not we offer wine or bread to God, because that is that's what we've always done. All food and drink should always be offered to God, whether it's wine or not. Right? This is why we pray before a meal and we pray after a meal. Um, Melchizedek is another a great example, right? So, um, I would just say, no, that that's not the case in terms of what you're saying. Uh, and remind me of your question. Now your question is, oh yeah, well, it's just, <laughs> individual it's, halakha. I, I think, I think that, uh, that I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with celebrating the Passover the way that, uh, people, uh, you know, the Jewish people have done for, for a long time. I know that plenty of messianics, including my father and my mother are going to have what would be considered a traditional, uh, Passover Seder on Monday night. That's, that's fine. And well, I have nothing against that. Um, I think that the traditions often were, were built off of cultural elements. They were responses to Christianity in, in many cases. The Afikomenos is, is a perfect example of this. Um, and so I think that there's, there's no commanded way that we have to do this, right? We are supposed to have a memorial meal unto God. According to the Torah, we're supposed to have the Passover, uh, the Passover lamb there. We can't, so we do as best we can. We have a memorial meal to the, to the Lord. And in that, I think it's up to each individual house to figure out how they're going to do that and to set their own tradition. I do think, however, and this is the last thing I'll say before I pass back to you, I do think tradition is important. And what I mean by that is whether or not you're going to uh, celebrate the standard Jewish tradition or whether or not you're going to make up your own, I think it's important. And I've, I've realized this more and more with my own children. The ki our kids need something to hold on to. As they grow older, those traditions become nostalgic and they become things that they want to, to pass on and keep going, keep going with because it's the tradition, right? And so my family has, has started to, uh, we've created... We've taken some traditions from Christianity. We've taken some uh, traditions from Judaism, and we have what we call household traditions. But the household traditions are just as important to us as the other traditions. Why? Because there are families' traditions, and I think that these are the kind of things that that you're talking about. And I think that they're the kind of things that that we need to to uh, solidify as believers in our home. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I think whether it's well, I know. I think you've shared before. Like you guys love. Mexican food, right? So it's like, right. well, so you can take things that are really good, you know, and that you like from Mexican food, and you can uh, still uh, integrate, like exp express your walk of your love of God through food, according to the Torah, and enjoy Mexican cuisine at the same time. Or, you know, it's a, that's just another example is where God gives commandments that are designed to to keep the priorities right, right? So that we love God, we love our neighbor. These are all these priorities are the, the core. And these, everything is contingent on that. So we, but we then bring that meaning in our own unique historical circumstance to that commandment. And so... Uh, but then when the, tra but traditions can then become solidified, like, okay, like there's, there are, there are probably Jews that would never go to a Seder unless there were four cups. Right. There right. has to be four cups. Well now, but is that crustified, calcified tradition now that obscures potentially like, cause Yeshua also wants us to remember that traditions in the word of God are to be remember we're to keep in mind that they're separate it, it's not a bashing of all tradition but it's saying look and so in for in my opinion that's why it's good to do it a little different 
maybe do, you know, maybe change some things up in, in the way you celebrate Passover from last year. You know, I can't, and they're going to be different anyway. Why? Because the conversational element, you know, for me, I always like to get the popcorn going in terms of like discussion. And that's always unpredictable. And that's a beautiful thing. And so that in and of itself is going to make each Passover unique. Plus you can have different people. I mean, you might, your core family might there, but you might have guests that are different from this year to that year, you know? So I there's can't tell all sorts you, I of can't, things that are always changing. You brought up the four cups. I can't tell you how many, I mean, every pastor I've ever met will tell you, tell you, oh yeah, well, this is the, you know, this, this is the third cup that Yeshua or that Jesus drank, you know, or what it's like, okay. Fine. <clears throat> I'll tell you last little last little story slash anecdote before we go. You know, uh, when my children were young, and you know, I like everyone else have had the the Christmas debates with family members and whatnot. My family doesn't celebrate Christmas. Our extended family does, and they have been quite sore um, that we don't celebrate Christmas. And one of the things I realized when my children were when my son was young, before we my daughter even came along, was that. I, I thought, how am I going to rival Christmas? I'll never be able to rival Christmas with any of the biblical festivals. You know, my favorite, my favorite holiday is Passover. It's my favorite. I love it. How do I get my son and my kids as excited for Passover as they would be for Christmas? Because I was young once. I was, you know, when I was six, we had a Christmas tree and I loved Christmas. So how do, you know, how do I get my kids that excited? And I'll tell you, Bribery works every time. I figured th what I always looked forward to as a child was the presents. Surprise wanted, gifts. Yeah, I wanted the gifts under the tree. That was the best part of Christmas, right? And so my kids, you know, there's been a rabbinic Jewish tradition of getting the leaven out and having a leaven hunt before before uh, Nissan 14, right? You let the kids go around and find all the leaven in the house. Well, I just figured, hey, you know what? We're not going to get presents on any other holiday. We're not going to give pre we don't give presents to our kids on birthdays. We're not against birthdays. We throw the party and their their friends bring the presents. That's kind of the, our deal with our kids. We host. Okay? <laughs> we we host and everybody else Cake brings and the ice presents. cream. Yeah, exactly. But we've decided <laughs> that presents are one thing that we do once a year. We do them on Passover. And the kids have the leaven hunt and at the end of the leaven hunt, guess what they find? They find all their presents. And they have le they have Passover lists going all year round, right? Now, we don't listen to that until a week beforehand, but I want this on my Passover list. You know, my kids love Passover and I get that they probably love Passover for the wrong reasons right now, but you know what? They love Passover. And as they grow older, I'm hoping that the same thing will happen that it happens for a lot of people is that the tradition of Passover will become nostalgic in a way that Christmas becomes nostalgic for people in our culture today. So if you're looking for ways to get your kids super excited about Passover, presence is the way to go. All right. Passover is on Monday night and uh, when the sun goes down and uh, if you are celebrating Passover this year, we wish you a very, very hearty and joyful Passover may be done unto our master and King Yeshua. And uh, we hope, I think we will be around on Friday for Mystery Bible Theater 3000. No promises on that. We're not sure. We think we're going to do uh, Mystery Bible, but no promises. Otherwise, we will be back in the middle of Passover next week. Uh, I think we'll be back because, uh, yeah, why not? We, we won't be able to prepare for it. So it might be a on the fly Passover special. Um, but that's okay. And why won't we be able to prepare? We won't be able to prepare because I'm taking Monday off to get ready for the Seder. And then of course, Tuesday is a Shabbat, which means Wednesday will be very on the fly if we have a show on Wednesday. And you know what? Maybe we'll take the week off since it's Passover. Who knows? You're going to, you're going to have to find, you're just going to have to wait and see. All right. We hope that this conversation has done... Get the leaven out. Yeah, get the leaven out. And that is the glorify our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. Why? I think you know why. It's because Messiah matters. Why?